is the expense of those greenhouse gas emissions worth the capacity to invest energy to capture greater quantities of micronutrients? Hello, everyone. My name is Luis Ferrero, one of the hosts of the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt podcast. And today we have the privilege of receiving Dr. Robin White, uh, Associate Professor at Virginia Tech. First, thank you, Robin, for joining us uh, and sharing a little bit of your expertise. Uh, could you please give us a brief background about yourself? Thank you so much, Luis, for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. Um, by way of introduction, I guess I did my degrees at Washington State University focusing on sustainable beef production systems. Uh, transitioned to Virginia Tech in 2014 to do a postdoc focused on dairy cattle and uh, animal nutrition, and then transitioned into a faculty position here uh, in 2016, where our program focuses on the animal environment interface. So. Uh, trying to understand how animals contribute to climate change and how they are affected by it. Yeah, obviously, we are very familiar with your work and in, uh, it, you seem to work in a lot of different disciplines, not only related to uh, dairy science, but today we would like to discuss with you a little bit more about this issue of climate change and how the dairy industry is part of that uh, for good and for bad, of course, right? Uh, nothing is perfect. And if you have any suggestions, you know, uh, to our uh, listeners on what can we do to help with this issue as an industry? Yeah, so the narrative around the environmental impact of ruminant animals has really evolved over the last 10 years or so. Um, our industry does contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, both through the production of methane from fermentation and from manure storage, and to uh, nitrous oxide emissions. Um, of course, we have some fossil fuel usage for things like electricity on farms, but the major contributors are going to be that uh, methane and nitrous oxide. In attempting to find strategies to minimize the environmental impact of dairy production systems, then those, those two targets become the low-hanging fruit. And we see a lot of um, exciting opportunities uh, that have really evolved here over the past couple of years uh, with a focus on mitigating enteric methane. Um, there are other experts that can go into those ad nauseum, so I won't talk too much about them today. but. Certainly, uh, over the next 10 to 15 years, I would expect that efforts to try and leverage things like feed additives or alternative diet formulation techniques to minimize enteric methane. So, yeah, I highly agree with you. Those are great insights. So let me ask you a very speculative question. What would happen if we remove all cows from the planet? Do you think we would solve this issue associated with greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, so that's a, a loaded question. You know, we've done some work exploring what would happen if we uh, eliminated animal agriculture from the United States. And what we see is that although animals contribute 50% of agricultural emissions currently, if we remove them from the agricultural system, uh, based on the assumptions that we make about how humans would continue to use agricultural land, we would only see a reduction of agricultural emissions by about 30%. So it's not proportional to the current contributions of livestock. And this is partially because feeding humans has an environmental impact. The impact differs depending on whether we're talking about plant or animal-based agriculture. But those two systems are complementary in terms of the types of nutrients that they provide. And both of them uh, provide essential nutrients and high density sources of nutrients that are needed to support healthy human diets. So which would be some of the key nutrients, you know, that we supply through animal agriculture that will be harder uh, for us to replace in the human diets? Uh, if we eliminate the animal agriculture from the United States, for example? 
So one of the nutrients that we see in dairy products in particular that is in low global supply, but in high concentration in milk is calcium. And so thinking about some of those micronutrients, things like essential miner minerals, vitamins, and fatty acids that are provided in high concentration in animal source foods, um, rather than macronutrients like protein, which we often tend to focus on in the animal agriculture space, is really where we provide a niche in terms of feeding humans. Yeah, no, I think those are all great points, you know, and I highly agree with you. Uh, obviously, I'm very biased because I work with the dairy industry and I'm a big fan of uh, dairy and beef products. But uh, at the end of the day, definitely some of those nutrients are irreplaceable. So if we briefly change topics, uh, something that I think is very key, uh, at least in nutrition, is how we can incorporate some of those different uh, industry byproducts into ruminant diets. So what's your perspective on that in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, you know, ruminant animals provide a really challenging uh, compromise within the food system. They have this incredible ruminant ecosystem that allows them to incorporate material that we would not otherwise be able to capture for human food production. Um, and to convert it into these high density sources of micronutrients, but they do so at the expense of increased greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so it, it really comes to the, the point of how those two really humanitarian services are valued by societies. Is the expense of those greenhouse gas emissions worth the capacity to invest energy to capture greater quantities of micronutrients. Um, I don't have the answer to that question, what the right balance is, but I think that that's, that's what we talk about at a societal scale. At a sale, a global leader in nutritional solutions and the provider of Smart Amine M. Visit milkpay.com to calculate your return on investment when you balance your feed with amino acids and to learn how Smart Amine M is the product for dairy producers who want to optimize milk production, component levels, and the lifetime performance of their herds. Regardless, um, I do think that it is essential if we're going to continue the production of ruminant products to ensure that we are really making efficient use of that unique ecological niche of these animals. We need to be ensuring that diets are not competitive with humans uh, to make the best use of um, the physiology that we have available. Absolutely. Those are all great points, you know, and uh, I, I, I do agree with you that we, we have to continue some of those discussions. Obviously, there is room for improvement regardless of the activity uh, we participate at. But obviously, from a diet perspective, there's a lot we can learn and a lot of we can adjust in order to help mitigate some of those issues. So thanks again, Robin, for joining the podcast today. Uh, so today we had Dr. Robin White at Virginia Tech sharing a lot of the expertise associated with greenhouse gas emissions and some of the benefits uh, that the ruminant industry provides to that, as well as some of the issues that we know that's out there. Uh, so thanks again, and we, we will see you in the next episode.